Hello, it's uh, Paul Beck with the game and uh, Musical Cats here. This guy, uh, Shackleton, got very, very jealous that uh, Sally was taking over the, uh, the uh, you know, becoming a video star at his expense. So he decided that, that uh, there was a bit of a cat fight going on and he decided that he would displace Sally and uh, take his rightful place in the video. So... Uh, so let me get back to the paper. Um, I was talking about the bias of the models. So the models do not, they greatly under predict the frequency of blocking events for one thing. And they also underestimate the duration of blocking events for another thing. Now, if you compare the model output the model bias so those are called biases of the model so we've got winter across the top we've got summer so this is june july august and we have december january february and this is the bias in the models in the percent so you compare the model output to the data and you run the model backwards start at 1961 run it to 1990 and compare it to the data and what the model is showing is that it's under predicting the um, so it's under predicting anything blue is an under prediction. So there's more blocking seen in reality in the in the blue areas. The model's under predicting what the reality is. So most of the most of what we see on these plots is blue. This is where the under prediction is the greatest. So here, for example, it's under predicting the number of blocking events that occur here um, by, you know, about eight to 10% or so is what it's showing. So we're getting lots more in. So the reality is we get lots of different blocking events and the models uh, don't, pre don't pick those up. They don't predict those should occur. And also the duration of the blocking events that we see in reality, uh, they last much longer than the model would, would predict. Okay, so the models are very biased. And if we do look at projections of future climate, okay, um, then this is what we get in terms of comparing, uh, the, if, if you take the RCP 8.5 projections and you compare the 2061 to 2090 period with respect to the 1961 to 1990 period, um, then this is the difference, uh, this is the, uh, the difference. Uh, so the models are, are, are uh, the, this is what the models are projecting w that will happen to blocking as we move forward. So they project that the areas to the south will get more blocking events, the areas over the Arctic will get fewer. Um, that's in December, January, February. And they predict that in the summer months, June, July, August, there'll be more blocking events in the high Arctic and fewer blocking events at lower latitudes. Okay, so that's what the models are, are showing. But again, take this with a grain of salt because the models aren't really predicting too well the frequency of the existing blocking and uh, the duration. And there's other local effects. So, so uh, you know, there's other effects with land sea temperature contrast because as the jet streams as the arctic warms significantly and the jet streams weaken then the the uh the, they weaken and they become wavier then there can be more uh dependence of their uh behavior on the land sea temperature contrast for example um and they can also shift as the jet, jet streams shift the blocking shifts what these papers what this paper doesn't mention is that the, you know, as we lose Arctic sea ice and the cold pole, if you like, the cold region in the Arctic becomes centered over Greenland, they don't talk about how the jet streams will likely, as I've said in previous videos, will become offset and, and not centered anymore about the North Pole, but centered about more about the center of, of Greenland. Okay, uh, and that's not in the models at all. That's not even considered. Um, but they are doing major efforts to better understand the uncertainty and future blocking projections. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but basically they need to understand the processes better. So it does seem that upper level tropical warming 
you know, so the tropics also can play a big role here. So upper level tropical warming is considered to be a key factor driving the reduction in blocking according to the models due to its effect on strengthening the zonal winds. So if the zonal winds strengthen, that's the zones around, the, the, the zone is, uh, so that's the, the winds around the earth is opposed to the north, meridional winds, the north-south winds. So if the zonal winds strengthen at the expense of the north-south um, direction winds and meridional winds, then there'll be less blocking. Um, the influence of near surface Arctic warming, it says, is more contentious, with some studies suggesting this could increase blocking, but others suggesting a negligible or even negative change in blocking of current. So I guess the jury's still out. It's a tug of war between what's going on in the Arctic and what's going on in the tropics in terms of the effect on the jet stream. Okay, uh, but there's uh, you know, they don't, there's not a good theory on, on the, you know, in, in dynamical um, atmospheric physics on, you know, what causes the blocking, how they develop, um, why they last as long as they do, and how they dissipate. Um, okay, so that's going to be a pro until that's sorted out, we won't get a good handle and we can't, we can't get better models. Um, Okay, so perspective. The general term blocking covers a wide variety of flow patterns. A plethora of blocking indices has been developed as a result, and uh, this makes it daunting for people outside the field, it says. And, um, you know, there's no, the models just, just miss, miss, miss the blocking. So um, there's also natural variability, strong natural variability or internal variability in the system. And uh, so let me just go back up to the, the main figure just to summarize here. Um, okay, so where are we here? Let me go back up. Okay, so these are the, this is some of the key factors to keep in mind that there's, there's basically five configurations of blocking. There's the basic one, symmetric, where you get a strong ridge, the ridge is persistent, it blocks the flow of west to east air, which has to move significantly around it. Um, the, if the uh, ridge goes higher up into the north and the, the troughs drop further down, you get the omega block uh, pattern, then this whole thing can be rotated in an anticyclonic fashion. So this ridge, this trough gets deeper and deeper, this one gets smaller and smaller, the ridge gets twisted over to the right. Um, Anticyclonic wave breaking situation for blocking. You can have cyclonic blocking. So the rotation is in the opposite direction. So this ridge, this, the ridge gets tilted over. This trough gets deep extended and is larger. And this one uh, is weakened and moves upwards. So you can get this configuration. And also you can get so-called Rex or dipole block where you, you have the ridge here. It's like this pattern, but now you have a low pressure area stuck in here. Okay, so you get this dipole, you know, high pressure here, low pressure there. This is called the Rex or dipole block. The key thing is that these, the models don't predict the onset of these things very well. Uh, they form in one to three days and they remain quasi-stationary for up to several weeks or longer and then they dissipate and the key thing is is that they cause extreme weather events, significant extreme weather events. So under a ridge, very, very hot, heat waves, very, very dry in these regions of the troughs, very, very wet and stormy, lots of floods, okay? So that's the whole key. These things are very important. Um, to on extreme weather events. So we need to understand more about how they form, why they last as long as they do, and, um, you know, uh, and try to anticipate them, try to predict them. Why, and why do they dissipate once, once they're there and stationary for quite a while? Why do they end up dissipating? So I highly recommend that you download this paper, have a look at it yourself, and, uh, you know, hopefully I, I, I can help you. Uh, my explanations have helped uh, explain to you what's going on in this paper. Now, some of the key papers, I've got a whole 
number of papers here that I'm reading. So I'll do the filtering and reading for you. This one is key. The size of the atmospheric blocking events is increasing in response to climate change. So the area underneath the blocking is increasing as climate change accelerates. So this is going to affect more and more people with extreme weather events. I'm going to talk about a number of these in more detail. Um, the, the latent heat release as the air rises, and this is in these um, um, warm convective um, regions that bring, the, bring is a diabetic uh, process that brings energy into the region of the blocking. Maybe that helps maintain the, the ridges in, in the blocking. The amplified Rosby waves can increase the risk of concurrent heat waves in major breadbasket regions. So you can have a you can have a strong ridge over North America, crop regions, and then a trough over the Atlantic, and then a strong ridge over Europe, and all of the food growing regions in North America and Europe are hammered by the strong ridges and heat waves. So this you know this so the pattern that's set up in these Rosby waves can cause simultaneous crop failures. That's an important paper. I'll definitely discuss that. This is a paper on the Russian and European heat wave in July, August 2010. Um, and uh, the changes, uh, the blocking over Greenland seems to be significant and persistent. Paper on that. Um, the tropics has a big influence on the jet stream and I'll talk about that. So I'm going to talk about a number of these different papers. I obviously can't go through them all. Uh, winter and summer northern hemisphere blocking in the computer models, the CMIP-5 models. Uh, blocking does occur in the southern hemisphere. It affects Australia, New Zealand, South America, but it tends not to be discussed so much. And the duration of the blocking events is generally not as long in the southern hemisphere because of the faster speed of the uh, jet streams in the southern hemisphere. You also don't have the huge land masses, so you can travel around the planet, circumvent the planet completely over the ocean, and set up stronger jet streams and stronger currents. But it does happen, and you know we know the Australian heat waves and the fires that there was some blocking involved in those phenomena, which I'll discuss in this paper. Of course, the Arctic is intimately linked to the polar vortex and extreme weather events. Um, and this is the Michael Mann paper, how you get these planetary wave resonance. This is leading to extreme weather events. Uh, Arctic sea ice variability, it can affect the Pacific trade winds, which then can affect and also affect the um, jet streams in the Pacific sector. We don't talk about the Pacific sector so much. Uh, polar jet streams over Baghdad City causing variation over this sort of certain period. Uh, Rosby waves are on the sun. They're on other planets. So, you know, there's a paper on that which is quite interesting. Gives you insights into the behavior of, of jet streams. Rosby wave breaking induced enhancement of tropospheric ozone. So in regions of the, in the high pressure regions, depending on the elevation, in this case it's in the Himalayas, you can get ozone coming down to the surface from up above. And that can be very hazardous to people in that region. And it's related to the Rosby wave uh, breaking and the jet streams. The wave power, how that's changing in mid-latitudes, if you take the wave and you measure the power of it. Um, the idea of atmospheric rivers and how they affect, how they mix with the planetary scale wave and their roles in Arctic warming, etc. Um, what's happening in the Pacific with Rosby wave breaking near Japan in the summer. Okay, one other paper on ozone, the ozone effect, uh, behavior of the wave packet of uh, effects on the monsoons of, of low-level jet streams. Okay, uh, Rosby wave propagation from the Arctic into the mid-latitudes. Does it arise from latent heating or a transarctic uh, wave train? So, so you can clearly see, you know, the topography effects of locking the waves. Um, you can see that there's all, you know, this is an area of very intense research. The idea of wave guiding for Rosby waves, that gets back to the Michael Mann uh, paper. Um, precipitation events uh, at the last glacial 
maximum 